All right, thank you so much for everyone joining in today's session. Um, we're, today we're joined by Dr. Scalia. Um, I first of all wanna welcome, welcome all of you to the session. And uh, for reference, my name is Michael. I'll be hosting today's session. So Dr. Scalia, just to give him a quick introduction, is the physician in chief of the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center and leads the only freestanding trauma center in the nation. And it's also the best known trauma center in the world. Um, so we're definitely honored to have you on. For our audience, we have a few reminders. At the end of the session, we're gonna have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, just type them in the chat and we'll go through all of those during the Q&A. For future shadowing sessions, feel free to check our Instagram where we'll send out posts over upcoming sessions and you can keep tabs on those. And also we have our event calendar at the bottom of our website's page. So that is updated with all scheduling sessions. And uh, you'll be able to see sessions for all months um, from the ones that we have now coming into December to up to February. And we're scheduling sessions even past that um, in the future, but you'll be able to see all of them on the calendar and we're gonna update you weekly over new sessions on our Instagram page. So check out both of them. And also if you have Google Calendar with our event calendar at the bottom of our website's page, you can copy those sessions from our calendar to set reminders for those sessions. Um, and if you have any questions over how to do that, just let us know. It's at the bottom of our website's page. You go to the calendar, click one of the sessions and then say copy session or copy um, event. And then it should transfer over to your Google Calendar if you have a Google account. But with all of those reminders and the introduction covered there, um, feel free to take it away, Dr. Scalia. All right. Evening. My name's Tom Scalia, as Michael told you. I am the physician in chief at the R. Adams College Shock Trauma Center. I, uh, this is the only freestanding trauma hospital in the United States. And uh, we deliver more injury care than does any other trauma center in the US. This is over the years we have become recognized, I guess is the right term for, uh, I hope excellence. And uh, we enjoy a, a reputation around the world um, that's really quite, uh, it's great, I guess I'll say, it's great. Uh, I never really planned for any of this to happen. If this is uh, my journey through this is anything but typical, but this is how I got here. I'm grateful I got here, but uh, I never really planned to do any of this. When I, I grew up in Rochester, New York, uh, in a, an extremely um, traditional Italian family, the only thing that wasn't traditional is my father left when I was a kid. That was highly unusual for the 1960s where Catholic uh, parents or husbands and wives stayed married even if they were miserable because uh, that's what the Catholic Church told them to do. Divorce was almost unheard of. Um, when I was in high school, I uh, thought I would end up as a social worker. I went to the University of Virginia for undergraduate school because I wanted to play college football. I, at that point, UVA was ranked 149th in the 150 Division I universities in football. And so I figured maybe I could play there. You can probably see I'm not a very big guy. I was, at that point, I probably weighed 140, 145 pounds. And in high school, I was a corner linebacker. I was still tiny by high school standards, but I was really mean. And so I was pretty, I wasn't half bad at it. Um, as it turned out, I played very little college football because at 145 pounds, I was 50 pounds lighter than the quarterback and uh, 80 pounds lighter than the running back. So that didn't work out quite as well, but uh, I, had a uh, re really a wonderful experience at 
UVA. Now, when I was at UVA, I was what was called an Eccles scholar. It's um, It was never really clear to me exactly. You didn't apply, you got invited. And I'm not really sure how I got invited, but I did. And if you were an Eccles scholar, you had, you didn't have to have a major. You didn't have to do prerequisites to whatever courses you wanted. You couldn't be closed out of a course. And when you thought you had satisfied uh, the requirements for a degree, you applied. And they either said, yeah, you qualify or go back and do some more. It was a very different time than it is now. And so I was meandering through the U University of Virginia and um, I had no idea of what I wanted to do. And then in my last year in the fall, I took a course called Abnormal Psychology. I have no idea of still to this day of exactly what abnormal psychology means. It was really experimental psychology and I completely fell in love. I said, this is what I want to do. This is so cool. So I went up to the guy that uh, was running the course and I said, this is, I want to be you. This is great. And he said, uh, okay, well, apply to graduate school and you'll get in and you'll come be my graduate student. You'll work in, with me in my lab and we'll, uh, you know, go solve the world's problems. And so that was great. That I applied. Now, a friend of mine was going to medical school and he uh, dared me to apply to medical school saying, I bet you can't get in. And I said, screw you, I bet I can. And so I applied only to one, two, three, four medical schools because I had no intention of going. Now, I got interviews at three the three Virginia schools. And I, I interviewed at UVA. So all I do is walk down the street to do that. And I interviewed at the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. Now, I had to drive to Richmond and I borrowed my girlfriend's car. I got there late. It was snowing, trying to drive in Virginia and the snow doesn't work so well. I finally got there. I get in. They say you're late. It's the last day of interviews. And I said, sorry, you know, I mean, I, it's the best I could do. They said, well, I guess we'll let you interview. And my first interview was with the Dean of Admissions, a guy named Miles Hench. And Dr. Hench was the only person at that point in my life that had had an interview or any discussion with me other than across a desk, right? Everybody else sat behind their desk and you sat in a in, in a chair across the desk and that's how this worked and he said oh no 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 no, come over here and he had a little table and chairs in, in the corner of his office he said please sit down let's talk so he said and i will never forget this he said tell me about something important to you didn't ask me a, how to calculate the krebs cycle or any dumb questions like why do you want to be a doctor and uh, so I talked to him about my family. I have um, four siblings, three brothers and a sister, all of whom are incredibly bright. I am, I have the lowest IQ in my family. And uh, two, one, one, two of them went to MIT. Uh, they're all artists as well as other things. And so I talked about my mama and what it was like to grow up at that point in a very unusual circumstance, right? Which is a single parent household. And I, I finished and I drove back to Charlottesville. And I remember telling my girlfriend, those people are the only people that have any idea of who I am. Nobody else does. But I don't really care since I'm gonna to go to graduate school and not go to medical school. Well, it turns out um, in April, I got rejected from graduate school. 
And the guy who was supposed to be the person I would work with was on sabbatical at the University of Michigan. So I, I found him and I called him up and I said, hey, remember me? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, things changed. I guess I should have told you. So I am now working in a factory. It's the middle of May. I'm working in a factory. I, that's what I, I have no you know, other job. I have no acceptance to do anything. And the Medical College of Virginia sent me a note saying, we just take, took you. Do you want to go to medical school? So I considered my options being, you know, working in a factory or going to medical school. Medical school sounded better. And that's how I, I, I started attending medical school. Now I went uh, through medical school. I did my clinical rotations. Nothing really spoke to me until I was a fourth year medical student. And I was in the medical intensive care unit with this guy named Barry Fowler. Barry was a chief resident in medicine. It was August, August of 1977, however long ago that was, 40 some years ago. And we worked 30 hours on 18 hours off. That was our schedule. We did that for a month. And uh, I, couldn't get enough of it. It was just the best thing. And um, I still, to this day, remember we get called to go over to the respiratory unit and there's some guy there whose, whose pulmonary function had failed and he was turning blue. He was getting ready to have a respiratory and then a cardiac arrest and dr fowler walked in he had this big handlebar mustache and when things like this happened the ends would start to twitch and he's in there the mustache is twitching they can't get an iv in this guy to give him sedation so we can put him on the ventilator and he looked at me and said well that's a problem I guess you better put an IV in him or he's going to die and turned around and walked out of the room. Would not happen in 2021. So all the nurses just stepped back and I said, wow, he's going to die if I don't do this. So I did it. None of them had been able to get an IV in. I put it in with one try. We gave the guy sedation. We put him on the ventilator and Barry, who I'm sure was just outside the door came back in and said, how does it feel to save your first life? All right, 43, 44 years later, I still remember that. But I'm now a fourth year medical student and I figure I must want to be an internist because that's what Barry was. I wanted to be him. There's a theme here. People have inspired me. I said, I want to be that guy. So I applied um, to, for residency in internal medicine, and I matched at a community hospital program in the city of Syracuse, New York. I had grown up in upstate New York. I really wanted to stay in Richmond, but I didn't get in. And <clears throat> so I went to, I went up there to start my residency. Now I wanted to do this because I wanted to work in the intensive care unit. And they wanted, this was a community hospital program that was dedicated to producing primary care doctors. This didn't work out so well for me. And so I am trying to figure out what I'm gonna do because I sure as hell don't wanna do this. And instead of, recognizing that I could go through and then do a fellowship, I said, I must need a, a new job. Well, I didn't like pediatrics much. I don't do well with sick kids and psychiatry had actually always interested me, 
but I had an experience in medical school. I'll tell you about it if anybody's interested that broke my heart. And I, I said, I can't do that. So I ticked off all the boxes and the only thing that was left was surgery. So I said, I guess I'm gonna do surgery. It's all that's left. So I apply to surgery residencies and I get accepted at upstate right down the street. It's still in Syracuse and Georgetown. Now, I probably should have gone to Georgetown, but it seemed like a lot of inconvenience to have to move yet again. So I figured I'd just stay in Syracuse and, and do that. The first day I was a surgical resident, I met this guy, Richard Burleson. His picture's right over there on my shelf. He was a transplant surgeon, and he was larger than life to me. And I said, I want to be this guy. So I decided I was going to be a transplant surgeon and I was going to stay and be his fellow and then be his partner. Everything was set. Um, then when I was a chief resident in 80, this would have been 1982, I, uh, he disappeared for two weeks and came back and he had had the bad taste to get a locally aggressive lung cancer and had gone to Boston to have surgery for it, which didn't work. And he died while I was a chief resident. And I was once again, heartbroken. I, I wanted to be him. And he was gone. Now, I figured I would just go into community practice in Syracuse. I, my girlfriend was there. I figured, what the hell, I'll just, this will work. But, you know, nobody tells you how to get a job. So I figured that if there were these two groups in town, both of whom were very, very good. And I said, boy, I'd work for either one of them, but nobody called me up and said, would you like to work for us? So it's now the 15th of May, there's another theme here. I'm gonna be unemployed in six weeks. So to finish my residency, I don't have a job. And um, I get a phone call from this guy, Norm Ackerman, who's in New York City who had been uh, on the faculty in Syracuse. And he said, hey, I hear you're unemployed. I thanked him for reminding me and said, it, it's true. And he said, well, we've got this fellowship. You know, they, they didn't really exist. I, if they existed, I didn't know anything about them. He said, we've got this fellowship in, in the ICU. He said, you always liked to do this. And, this person that was going to do it quit. So we've got an opening. You want to come down and, and interview for it. So once again, I considered my options, unemployed or being a fellow. Fellow seemed like a pretty good idea. So I drove down to New York City. I, inter <clears throat> I interviewed and I was accepted. Now, the funny side story here is yeah, maybe five years ago, eight years ago, I get invited to go back to Syracuse and give their big named lecture. So I, of course, am very flattered and I go give the lecture and I'm walking out after I give the lecture and who's there, but one of the guys that was in the, one of the groups that I wanted to work for. And he said, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. He said, why did you not come work with us? And I said, because you didn't ask me. He said, well, we were waiting for you to come in and ask for a job. We would have hired you in a heartbeat. So had <clears throat> I known that and gone in and asked for a job, none of this would have ever happened. I would have been a community general surgeon in Syracuse, New York, and I would have never done trauma. But 
I uh, so I go to New York City, and um, I do my fellowship, and I, I start looking for a job, and I hate them all. I, I I fell in love with New York. I just I, I wanted desperately wanted to stay. And around about May again, right? So in two months, I'm unemployed. Lou Del Gercio, whose picture's over there too, called me up and he said, I hear you're unemployed. Yes, sir. I again thanked him for reminding me. I am unemployed. He said, well, I'd like you to go down to Brooklyn and look at this job at Kings County Hospital. <clears throat> and you know, back then, all you ever said was, yes, sir. But I said, you know, Dr. Del Gercio, I don't wanna go to Brooklyn. I want to go, I want to, you know, work in Manhattan. That's where the cool people are. I want to be a cool person. And, and he, I'll never forget this. He just, he looked at me and he closed his eyes and he rubbed his head. He said, let me ask you a few questions. I said, yes, sir. He says, do you know where Brooklyn is? Yes, sir. This was, of course, before the days of computers. He said, do you own an automobile? Yes, sir. Do you own a set of maps? Yes, sir. Do you think you can find Brooklyn? Yes, sir. And he looks up and goes, then why are you still standing here? So I called up and scheduled an interview and I drove down and I drove across the Brooklyn Bridge and I drove into Brooklyn Heights, which looks like Georgetown. It's just these brownstones with trees and i said oh my god who knew brooklyn was this cool and i drove over to king's county hospital and i don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie fort apache the bronx which was shot about a hospital where i did part of my fellowship and i walked into king's county and it was loud and people were screaming and it was just on fire and i took a deep breath and i said i am home this is where i want to be and that was the first conscious decision i ever made about my career and in my 15 years in new york i had a number of jobs all of which kind of I didn't make any decision. I just kind of wandered through, but I got to be reasonably well known and we wrote a lot. And in 1997, again, I won't bore you with the whole story. I got the opportunity to come here. Now, if you do what I do, running the shock trauma center in Baltimore, is like playing center field for the Yankees. I mean, it is the job. And I was lucky enough to get this job. And so over the last, for the last 25 years, I have been here. We have made a huge number of changes. We have become, <clears throat> as I said, an international, uh, internationally recognized place. And we have had enormous opportunity. We have really changed the face of how injury care is delivered in the United States. We have become, uh, we were the only um, non-Chinese group invited to Sichuan after the big earthquake and uh, that was a remarkable experience to go work on the earthquake victims. Uh, I took a team of four, there were four of us that went over and an incredible opportunity to work side by side with the Chinese doctors and nurses. Again, a um, complete happenstance. The earth, I met the, the ambassador to China I don't remember why, I just remember I did. And a week later, the earthquake happened. And one of my partners, Jim Cushman, came in and said, you know, 
He would never call me Tom. I don't know why. You know, Dr. Scalia, we need to send a letter to the ambassador. And I said, why would I do that, Jim? And he said, because that's what's proper in China. So I said, okay. And I wrote a letter to the Chinese ambassador telling him how bad we felt that, and, and you know, I, blah, blah, blah. And what's the last line in any of those letters? If there's anything we can do to help, please call. So I sent the letter off the next day, the phone rang. And he said, you wanna to go to China and help? And I said, okay. I said, but we're gonna to need to, um, we need visas, we need. He said, oh, no, 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 they're on the way to you. How about tomorrow? Okay. So we got on an airplane the next day. We we flew to uh, to Chengdu and we set up shop in in the West China Hospital. It was um, a remarkable experience to see all of these people that had been crushed in the earthquake. They were all so sick, but they did great. These these guys in China are very very bright use a huge number of non-traditional therapies and um i remember one day they uh they brought in this iv fluid and it was dyed bright red i'd never seen anything like that iv fluid is clear right so i said what's that in through via the translator they said it's for hot. And I said, okay, I have no idea what you're talking about. And the next day they bring in a bag of IV fluids and it's dyed bright yellow. So I said, okay, I'll bite. What's that? And they say, it's for cold. And I just make this smart aleck comment, oh, he must have gotten too much of the red stuff yesterday. And th they looked at me and said, wow, you understand Chinese medicine. No idea of what either of those were. We had a, a wonderful, wonderful experience and made um, many friends that those friendships, uh, I still stay in touch with those guys and we exchange emails and it was just a great experience. We went to Haiti after the earthquake um same thing i'm uh i'm actually at the gym and i get a phone call and and this guy said listen i'm going on on uh whatever that npr i guess to talk about haiti i need a little give me three sentences about the maryland trauma system so i can plug it so i said okay here you go he gets on the radio, they talk. The next thing I hear is the phone rings as I'm leaving the gym, and it's one of the infectious disease guys. I said, I just heard that uh, that interview on the radio. You want to go to Haiti? And I said, sure. And I hung up. And then I said, what did I just say? I don't want to go to Haiti. But we had said yes. So to Haiti, we went. We were there. We had a team there. We rotated the teams. We were there for six months again i was the first part of the first group that went and you know we we were there just a few days after the earthquake we had to set up we had to pick up rocks and move them to set up the hospital the hospital was buried and so we set up an operating room and we sent up um tents that's you know it's haiti it's hot right and so we all we needed were was something to protect the patients if it rained and we set up a whole hospital and we as i said we were there for six months we did surgery we did another fabulous experience and so same thing uh, helping to set up a trauma system in northern italy you know close to my heritage and so um, all of this has been have to, has come from the ability to come to Baltimore and and be the chief at a place like the Shock Trauma Center. It's been a remarkably cool ride. 
Um, as I said, I never planned any of this. I never uh, expected any of this. It just happened. And so what's the the moral of the story? The this, this story is you follow your heart, I think. You go do what speaks to you. You don't let anybody tell you you can't do or you must do. You go do. And if you go do, and, and I'd like to think I've been, you know, I've helped in my life. If you go and you help and you're a decent human being, I think that nice things tend to happen to you. And a, a number of nice things have happened to me. And I'm now getting towards the end of my career. I've, it's, uh, you know, I, my, work is my life it's what i do i work still 100 110 hours a week i do uh, a huge amount of surgery i'll probably do 650 operative cases this year which is you know like two a day seven days a week it's it's a lot but i just this is so much a part of who i am that i just can't imagine doing it any other way or doing anything else so i will do it as long as i am good at it and as long as i am healthy and after that i don't know i'll figure something else out that is me well that's so great the to 30 hear. minute me yeah yeah that's so great to hear i love the passion the admiration for the specialty the journey behind it i mean it, it was quite a windy road but i mean it led to so much success which is so great to hear um, we do have a, a quick few questions maybe we can go through uh, for the last 30 minutes here. Sure. So regarding your journey, it was a really, really unique one. And I mean, it's definitely one that you can tell anyone and they'll, they'll be hooked to the conversation. If you hadn't gone down that path, though, to eventually become the trauma surgeon you are, do you think that you would have had as much admiration or appreciation for the specialty? Do you think that that journey really gave you a different take on it? Oh, abs yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I just, um, fundamentally, I believe that there are well people doctors and sick people doctors. I, I'm a sick person doctor. Uh, most of my practice is, is injury, but our group will take care of you no matter what, if, if you're sick, we're, we're happy to take care of you. And we're pretty good at figuring things other than injury out. And so <clears throat> the evolution of medical care has created these people. If you look at surgeons, there are surgeons that do almost all elective stuff. The breast surgeons, the guys that do the minimally invasive surgery many of the specialties like urology and ent are largely office-based and elective and or elective practices we're the people you call when you're sick and so it has the exact mechanics of what we do have evolved has evolved over time but the spirit of what it is we do hasn't really changed a hell of a lot and and so um i think it's very hard to know what it's like to live in my world if you don't live in my world and so i mean people as will come and say how can you possibly do that how can i possibly not what could be cooler than this Yeah, it really is the passion that drives you. Um, so along your journey, like I said, it was really, really unique. What was that key transition point, though, that really had your mind fixed on medicine? Uh, not necessarily surgery, but just medicine in general. I yeah. <clears throat> My dear sweet mama, um, she lived to be 99 and a half years old. She died um, a year and a half ago. I still miss her every day. She was, she raised all of us by herself. 
and the mantra in my house when I was a kid was you do for others before you do for yourself. I'm going to guess she said that to me 10,000 times when I was a kid. And, and so I was programmed to, to give, to serve. Now, <clears throat> medicine just happened to become the vehicle that I used to serve. It could have been social work. It could have been being a guidance counselor. It could have been other things. It just happened to end up being medicine. I mean, it's an easy fit, right? Being a doctor or a healthcare worker of some kind and giving, helping to cure, that's a pretty straight shot to doing for others. And so um, the 100 or 110 hours is the part for doing for others before I do for myself. But the doing for other part was just scripted from when I was a kid. Yeah. And between the, the training that you had um, back in you know, the 1990s or around there and now, how do you see the differences? How have the differences changed? Have they just evolved because of um, how people want them to? With I know that there's, for example, um, the new law with how many hours you can work as a resident. Um, that's just due to the, the social change, the social push um, for awareness over just life balance um, yep. as the years have gone by. And I'm sure a lot of other aspects have changed, maybe even specific to your specialty. So yep. can you absolutely. Take a that's yeah, sort of cute. I have this lady that worked, then left, and now again has come back and works for me. Her name's Deb Stein. She's a New Yorker. And she was my number two person. I, I like her in every way possible. And, and she once came up to me and said that we were talking about work life balance. And she looked at me and said, it's kind of hard to have work-life balance when you have no life, Tom. <laughs> so yeah, fair enough. The um, you know, the evolution of the of the specialty, I think of all medical specialties, has been driven by the incredible increase in technological capabilities that has exploded over the last 20 years five years. You know, when you think back, when I was a resident, there were no computers. There was no CAT scanner. There was nothing. It was you, your hands, your eyes, and some, you know, a stethoscope and not a hell of a, and some x-rays. That's all you had. And so, it was a, um, excuse me one second. Hello. Um, and so the advent of this highly sophisticated imaging equipment, the electronic medical record, computerized um, treatment algorithms, all of this has radically changed how it is we do things. And much of it's been for the better. Not all of it has been for the better. People now make rounds looking at a computer screen, not at a patient. The answer is in the computer somewhere. And I think that's horrible. It's a person we're caring for, not a computer. 
and um, I think that that has reduced the humanity in medicine. And I uh, have become famous. You know, the residents will uh, be sitting there trying to solve a problem, looking at a patient, uh, looking at a computer, and I'll go grab them, pull them out from behind the computer and drag them into the patient's room and say, the answer's in here. It's not out there, it's in here. And I still will, um, when I have a, a, a very hard problem, I'll, I'll drag a chair into the room, I'll sit down, I'll sit there and stare at the patient because the answer's there somewhere, right? It's my job to, and I'll get up and I'll go make an adjustment and this or that. And then I'll go sit, sit down and, or go over and listen to the patient's lungs or heart or something and sit and look. And I will sit there for hours until I figure it out. And that is a, obviously, a uh, little bit of an old school way to do it, and but I think it's still a very relevant way to do it. And, and so the, the goal here is to harness the technology in a way that makes sense. But as I have said to the residents and my young partners a thousand times, we take care of patients, not pictures. The pictures help us take care of the patients but we're not actually taking care of the pictures. Definitely. And um, that's a hard thing to teach young people who are so um, married to their technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also wanted to mention with, um, in terms of training, a lot of times, especially as a recent, grand rounds are being pushed as a, a great way to educate physicians in training. So yep. for the people listening in who might not be familiar with Grand Rounds, what it offers, how it is useful in terms of educating physicians in training, why it is so important, why it is um, popular. Can you take yeah. us through exactly what they are? Yeah, Grand Rounds, th these are um, a tradition that goes back 100 years, maybe, maybe 200 years. And it was the once a week, usually, once a week where the entire department comes together. And in the old days, in the very formal days, you know, the full professor sat in the front row and the associate professor sat behind them. The medical students were in the nosebleed seats way at the top. And a subject was discussed um in a very academic formal way um, it would take sometimes these were and when i did it as a resident we would have case presentations so residents would get up and present cases and the professors would ask them questions and ask people in the audience questions so it was a group discussion about the salient issues in a particular patient. And then that would be followed by a very formal lecture about a topic, usually, obviously, the speaker would pick a topic about which they had a great expertise. And it was a, um, it was a sacred time. Everybody showed up. Uh, I mean, in order to leave, a patient had to be dying. You didn't get get up and go answer uh, the sleep medicine page. You just piled those up until, and everybody knew when Grand Rounds were the nurses left you alone unless it was highly important. Those are still. Um, they still exist. They are not nearly as formal as they once were. Um, they're not as sacred as they once were. Uh, but it was a um, 
we they in many places they were Saturday morning. So everybody showed up. The entire department showed up on Saturday morning, and the weekend started at noon, not in the morning. It was after grand rounds that if you were off, you got to sign out. Yeah. And can you take us also through how training has transitioned over the years? We discussed um, in a general sense how medicine has transitioned from things like paper charts to now um, going really through computers, like you, you told a few stories there. But in terms of training, when it comes to residency and fellowships, how do you think program directors have, on first of all, the admission side of things, how do you think that they made a may have varied their outlook on things like USMLEs, research, the importance behind that, yeah. uh, different factors. And then also when it comes to actual training, those years of, of three, four or so years of residency and fellowship. Yeah, there was, um, particularly if you look at surgery, it was a completely white male dominated specialty until 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And it wasn't until medical schools changed, right? Because when I went to medical school, in 150 students, there were 15 women and 135 men. Now at the University of Maryland, the school's probably between 55 and 60% women and 40 or 45% men. And so the male dominated specialties kind of had a problem because the pool of applicants became more and more female and women <clears throat> had uh, different priorities or some women had different priorities, right? You're a, you are finish medical school when you're 26 or 27 years old. If you're gonna do surgery, that's five, six, seven years. And if you are interested in having a family, that would be about the time when you would likely be interested. And so residencies had to make accommodations as more and more women joined um, the ranks of surgeons. Now, um, even the guys, right? This idea that um, all you would do is work for the time you were in training just went away. The 80 hour work week made that evaporate in a very real way. And so um, <clears throat> different people got drawn to, to specialties that they may not have been interested in earlier because the lifestyle issues uh, really became, were different. Um, and I also wanted to cover, it's really interesting. You founded a, a program, a military program, Sea stars Yep. I'm sure that was a big project. Can you take us through the process and maybe sure. just initial um, motivation for starting it? Yeah, yeah. Um, when we went to war, the first war in Iraq, 2000, not even, in the 90s, it turned out that we entered this conflict and made, and made no um, plans for what we were gonna do with injured soldiers. It turned out that in the entire military, um, Air Force, Army, Navy, there were less than five really trained trauma surgeons. Well, that's not gonna cover it, right? So we had a, um, I was involved in a project when I was in New York City, it's probably the early 90s, um, of <clears throat> putting together civilian teams that were gonna get airlifted to lot to Ramstein in Germany 
and the casualties were going to be evacuated and we were going to rotate two teams every two weeks or something. I don't remember. Now it turned out that the um, there were never enough American casualties that we needed to activate it, but the military figured out that they they better get military surgeons up to speed with how to care because many of these people in the military maybe did trauma when they were residents but had done none since so the idea and the same was true of the nurses and the technicians and everything so the idea of training a military civilian partnership to train people was born and they decided all three branches decided to do to do this in houston well if you know much about the military the idea that the air force army and navy would cooperate and everybody would live together harmoniously didn't work out quite so well so that everybody there was a quick divorce and ultimately the navy went to la county the Army went to Miami, the Ryder Trauma Center, and the Air Force came to us. Now, <clears throat> again, like many things, this was serendipity. This guy, Ty Putnam, who had been a fellow here years ago, came to me and said, I'd like to, what do you think about putting an Air Force training program here? I said, that sounds like a cool idea. Let's do it. So he had this PowerPoint he went through and said, yeah, that all makes sense. Let's do it. And I'll never forget. He said, you know, Dr. Scalia, to get anywhere in the military, any program that succeeds has to have a cool name. If you don't have a cool name, nobody will pay attention. I said, okay, you got a cool name. He said, how about Sea Stars? Okay, Sea Stars it is. And that's, and we, we birthed the program sitting in a conference room having a cup of coffee i said let's go and we you know the air force came in and we started this program um and it's designed as a refresher course for the nurses and technicians and the paramedics and the doctors so before they get deployed over to iraq and afghanistan they come spend a month with us and they retool. There's some both didactic training, simulated training, and then there's real life stuff working on our teams. And it's been incredibly successful. I was lucky enough, again, a side story. I went to Afghanistan as a civilian in 2010 and spent three weeks at, in the, at, at, with the war, helping to take care of patients and touring and every place i went somebody would run over to me and say do you remember me and i'd say yeah, no they said well i was one of your sea stars rotators and let me and then the stories would start on the first day i you know we had this case and i was ready to go and and, and. it was great <clears throat> It's in, uh, you know, we're going to keep this program going forever. Sure, definitely had a quite a big impact. And like you said, the need was there. So then you just acted on it. All yeah, all you know, we have, we train about 300 kids and people a year. So in 20 years, that's 6,000 people we've trained. And if you think about every person that those 6,000 people touched, it's a lot of reach. Absolutely. It's great. Yeah, definitely. It's really amazing how you kind of spread out your, your platform from being a trauma surgeon in the OR, um, one of the, the most famous and well-known at that, and at the same time having founded this uh, military training program with Sea stars at the same time being a funded investigator. Um, I don't think we had the time to cover your research. Maybe we can go through a little of that. So what launched you first into being involved as an investigator? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's just, I, I am fundamentally a, doc, a clinical doctor. And the research we have done, both the basic science and the clinical research, 
has been born out of clinical observations. You know, when I was in New York, I worked in the busiest trauma center in New York City. Now I work in the busiest trauma center in the United States. And when you do, when you work in a place like that, you go, wow, that's odd. I wonder why that's true. Or I wonder if it is true. And you say, well, we can answer that question. Let's design a project that'll ask and answer that question. And the cool thing about doing this is you ask and answer a question and that answer only leads to another question. And then you answer that one and that leads to another question. And so we are constantly asking and answering questions. Definitely but they all the questions come from something we observe mm -hmm. in the operating room, in the resuscitation unit, in the ICU. Yeah, definitely. And it, it really explains how many or why there are so many publications out there. I mean, it's in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions at this point. Um, Towards the end of the hour, I also want to go through some maybe interesting or unique cases over your time with training, serving as an attending. I'm sure there's tons, uh, but are there a few that maybe you can? Yeah. You know, <clears throat> once again, the, um, the advances come from the patients. A and uh, I don't know. We had this young girl. 16 years old. I was on call. I get the radio goes off. They said, we're going to bring this girl. And I said, okay, what's going on? She fell off a golf cart. I said, are you kidding me? You're putting a 16 year old girl that fell off a golf cart on a helicopter and flying her here. I said, okay, fine. You know, bring her in. No problem. And then, but inside my head, I was going, what a waste. Well, it turned out she had a terrible brain injury. And um, it turns out that brain, bad brain injury affects all of your organs, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your liver, your everything. And she, every one of her organs failed. She developed terrible lung failure. And the problem is when you develop terrible lung failure, the ventilator, you have to turn the dial on the ventilator up so that the air gets forced into their lungs harder in order to get the good air in and the bad air out. Well, when you increase the pressure in your chest, the pressure in your head goes up, which is bad for you if you have a brain injury. So we've got this young girl. Um, we decompress her abdomen to reduce the pressure in her head. We stand her straight up on a table. She's not lying in a bed. She's now standing straight up on a tilt table. And the pressure in her head is still terrible. And the pressure in her lungs is still really, really high. And this is what I mean about um, <clears throat> using opportunity, th clinical observation to drive stuff. So I went into my office and I said, because every time I talked to the family, I'd say, well, you know, this is bad, but we've got a solution. And I go out to talk to them and they said, what's the solution for this? And I said, yeah, I'm working on it because I don't know. So I went into my office and I told Stevie, the lady that runs my life, I said, nobody can bother me. And I closed the door and I sat on the couch and I just thought. And I said, I am not standing up until I figure this out. And ultimately the light bulb went off. And I realized that if we took her off the ventilator, if we stopped forcing air into her, that the pressure in her chest would go down and the pressure in her head would go down. But then how are we going to get the air, you know, get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out? And I figured out that if we put her on cardiopulmonary bypass, the machine would do the work. So honest to God, in order to put the cannula in to put her on bypass, we climbed up on ladders because she's standing straight up. 
and opened her neck and got the blood vessels out and did the same thing in her groin. And we put her on bypass and we turned the ventilator off and the pressure in her head came down. She ultimately made a complete recovery. She turned down Princeton to go to Vanderbilt where she became a nurse practitioner and she, I still see her around. Wow, what a case. Made, we made it up, right? Yeah, definitely. We I mean, made up the solution. Wow. It made physiologic sense. Mm -hmm. So we took physiology, we brought it to the bedside, we made it work. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What a, what a story to, uh, to wrap up with. Just before we end our session today, are there any last pieces of advice you'd like to give to yeah. the people out there, um, you know, with so much ahead of them, medical school, residency, fellowship, any advice that they have now that they can really leverage later on? Yeah. Afterwards? Yeah. Do what you love. If you love it, do it. If you're not sure, do something. The worst that happens is you don't like it. You go do something else. There is great tendency in society to try to make people conform. You're not allowed to do this. And that's baloney. You know, mu much of the great advances we've made, people said, oh, that'll never work. Oh, yeah, turned out it did. A and I would just say that you don't let the system put you in a box. You know, I go out and I meet, I bring my team in and I make each one of them introduce themselves to the patient or the patient's family. And the medical students will come in and I'll say, introduce yourself. And they'll say, well, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm just the medical student. And afterwards I say, that's not the way you say it. It's not, I'm just the medical student. I'm the medical student. You have a role on this team. Do your damn job. Be proud of the job you're doing. Yeah, you can't do my job yet. But you, it, if we're only as good as the weakest link in, in the machine here. So uh, I just think that when people say you can't, you say, yes, I can. And then you go do it. Wow. Well, I think, I mean, this has been a, a great session. Uh, fantastic. We went through your journey. We went through some interesting patient cases, uh, your involvement with the military program from earlier, which has had such a great impact, um, some research that you've done too. It's really been a great, great session. So we thank you so much, Dr. Scalia, for joining us today. My pleasure. Of course. You guys you. take care. Thank you. And Bye. For for our shadowers, we will be posting the quiz tomorrow on our website under the virtual shouting page. The quiz will be due at 11.59 Central Standard Time on this upcoming Wednesday, December 8th. So uh, be sure to look out for that. And to earn credit for our session attendance, you must pass that quiz to receive the certificate. Uh, for those listening also, be sure to catch us for our next virtual shouting session next week on Thursday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Central with Dr. Yates. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Scalia. We really appreciate it.